Dr. Mark Gudespot is the medical director of comprehensive MS care at South Shore Neurologic Associates, one of the largest MS clinics in New York State. Among many other topics, Dr. Gudespot has published articles on autoimmune autonomic neuropathies, movement disorders, and multiple sclerosis. He oversees the clinical research program at South Shore Neurologic Associates and has recently conducted research with our own Lauren Stiles. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Mark Gudespot. Thank you. Um, Lauren asked me to talk about multiple sclerosis and dysautonomia, and the more she spoke and the more she asked me to talk about it, I realized that that was always a big problem. So the discussion or overview, the explicit, implicit uh, things that I will talk about, really the topics we'll talk about chaos or diagnostic dilemmas, or why is it so difficult for me to get a diagnosis? What is multiple sclerosis and is dysautonomia seen in association with multiple sclerosis? The topics that I wouldn't cover is how you can say no to Lauren Stiles, and that I will leave to Rob Stiles, her husband, to um, give me that answer. And then the question really is how you can provide enough information in the time that's, that's asked to that you're given to provide answers to questions. And I'm not sure anybody in the room remembers Cliff Notes or Monarch Notes, uh, but for those who do, okay. So there's several different uh, talks in here. One is uh, the word disease actually means ill at ease when you're not comfortable in your own skin. And as many other speakers have said, it's a syndrome, constellation, or collection of similar problems or symptoms, but can be seen as a consequence or manifestation of multiple underlying disorders. So the one thing I will tell you is, as the images show you, put yourself in the patient's shoes or put yourself in the physician's shoes, and it's an uncomfortable place to be for both of them at the same time. So the other comment uh, that people always say is, it's all in your head, um, and sometimes we need to use what's called a BS meter, which uh, unfortunately it's not reimbursable. Uh, number one. Number two, uh, it's all in your head because your entire collective experience is in your head. So if you cut your head off, you have no more problems. So it's a very easy answer. Um, so the transition from health to illness is very, very difficult. It's easy when it's abrupt. When it's insidious, the comment that uh, I always am reminded when I look in the mirror is, when did you go bald? Uh, and the answer is, I, I th still think I have dreams where I have hair on my head. So when you noticed or complained about something is not when it starts. That's when a diagnosis is. So my illness did not start at a diagnosis. So when you look at this transformation from the caterpillar to the butterfly, they are all the same animal, but it's a transformation process. And that's what's very difficult for people. So it's a puzzle in the making for both family, patient, physician, clinician. So the comments to really ask are, tell me, what are the problems or symptoms that brought you to see me and what is bothering you? And what you really like to say is, tell me the history succinctly, avoid unnecessary, irrelevant, or inaccurate, or prejudicial information. But I guess that would not be such a great thing to say. So it's like listening to the story or listening to the music. And for anybody who's had the good fortune to see the show Hamilton, uh, one of the songs is, who tells your story? And that's a great song because the question is, who tells your story? So what questions should you ask that provide relevant and supporting information? So don't start with a diagnosis. You only confuse people. Tell them what the symptoms are. So there are some kid games. Where's Waldo? Headbands. Anybody remember the name game headbands? So I'm going to demand that the next 20 patients who come in to see me have their diagnosis on their head. And I think that would be so much easier for me. It's like the game charades. You're trying to give someone a clue as to what you have, and it's a game of charades. And for anybody who's seen The Odd Couple, when, um, when Felix Madison is trying to do the game, it's a pencil. And he's giving the most absurd comments for graphite. Um, so 
20 questions, headbands, charades, I spy, they're just not kid games. So the question is, what is my story telling you? What is my diagnosis? And remember, impatience never got you there faster, or as some people would say, don't drive with me. So it's a sea of information and many distractions, and you expect an answer very quickly, which is why there's frustration. And we'll talk about that. So you've seen this slide before, the blind man and the elephant. So as you see, your perception could be this is a chalice or faces. So depending upon how you look at it. So the real truth of the story is one subjective experience can be true, but this experience is inherently limited by its failure to account for other truths or a totality of truth. And that is the big disconnection that most people don't understand. So it's a puzzle game. And so the question is, where do the pieces fit? And the answer is not all. Sometimes it's not even the same puzzle. Some people have more than one problem. And the other question is, are all pieces of the puzzle present? On vacations, when my children were growing up, we would play puzzle games on rainy days. And one of the things I always enjoyed doing was taking one piece of the puzzle off the table, which I think would torture my children. Um, and I always had fun doing that. It's called child abuse. So Rubik's Cube makes the puzzle go into different dimensions. So the question is, you're not even sure when the pieces of the puzzle start to move or get lost. When the tree leaves go blow away, you know it's a person's face, but at some point, you won't see the face. So the puzzles can be in three dimensions. You can have wrong pieces of the puzzle. You can have nesting dolls, diseases within diseases. Someone with Alzheimer's disease, their perception is draw a clock. They will get the clock and all the numbers in, but only on one side for certain people. With So mazes are sometimes not fun. And even when a disease is described, becomes really interesting. So the quote down at the bottom here on the bottom right, if someone has a stroke and it's a left brain stroke, they may be paralyzed on the right side of their body and not be able to speak. That is a classic stroke syndrome. However, a case from the Bible, the Old Testament, is if I forget the O Jerusalem, let my right hand lose its cunning and my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, which becomes about a great discussion or description of what a stroke is. So when symptoms or syndromes are recognized, they've likely been here for many years before. So a case in point is for those in the room who've heard the song Lola by the Kinks, um, it's a love song. Boy meets girl, girl meets boy, they fall in love except there's some commentary in the song which makes you really stand back. And one is, she walks like a woman and talks like a man. When she picked me up, she nearly broke my spine. So the question really is, what is Lola? Who is Lola? But regardless of what you're seeing there, it's still a love song. So the song itself becomes extremely complicated. So there are signs in this song about a love song, but sometimes the signs are not so obvious. So I particularly like Go Away, um, Seldom Seen Road, and Slow Children. You know, the history and the examination, sometimes the signs are obvious, like road signs, but the obvious isn't so obvious, and sometimes the signs can be very, very confusing. State prison next le left, do not pick up hitchhikers. I'm not quite sure why you need that sign, but sometimes signs are really redundant or obvious. So it becomes the forest and the trees. You can see the leaves and you can pay a lot of attention to the bark on the tree, but still see the tree or the trees or the entire forest. So asking someone, what do I see in a short period of time is a really difficult question. It can be extremely daunting. And that's why one of my favorite characters is, is Mr. Magoo. I'm not quite sure how he's managed to navigate that, but there's a syndrome, a neurologic syndrome called cortical blindness, where someone cannot see something in front of their face, a piece of paper or a glass, but they can walk out of this room without tripping. So your first diagnosis is they are completely hysterical, but the answer is no, they are not. So perception and reality, M.C. Escher made a great career of seeing things and describing things. And for those of us on the bottom left here, um, 
those two yellow lines, they are the same length. So when you look at the zebras, I'm not quite sure you can see in the background the tiger or the elephant. Ask yourself, how many legs does that elephant have? And if you spend time looking at this just for a moment, you'll start to see movement or things change. That is an optical illusion. That is the way the brain is processing information. So the answer is you expect someone to take all the information that you provide and not be driven to distraction. So when you look at this, the one word that comes into play is focus. And it's hard to do that. So why do so many different doctors have different opinions? Well, I'll explain this to you. Classic education provides traditional understanding of illness. That's number one. However, appreciation of truth and accumulation of knowledge changes over time, and it's a journey like an evolutionary journey. Knowledge can set you free or trap you into a box, and for those people where their knowledge defines their existence, that is what a box looks like, or that is what a brick wall looks like. So there are lumpers and splitters. Some people will lump conditions and there are many variabilities in there, and some people split to the nth degree where every little variation must be a different disease. So it becomes really complicated. So incidence, prevalence, and awareness, the comments are it's only as common as diagnosed or only as common as considered. That doesn't mean it's rare. Huntington's disease is seen in seven in 100,000 people. Um, when you look at the incidence of Huntington's disease in people with psychiatric disorders, it may be as high as seven in a thousand. So the question is, where is truth, and what is the true incidence of these diseases? So what you see, the clinical phenotype, actually represents a heterogeneous family of disorders masquerading as unique individual diseases. So diseases like multiple sclerosis, dementia, Parkinson's, dysautonomia, they're umbrella terms. It's a family of diseases. And they're not homogeneous disorders. And that, I think, is the big thing that people like to hear. It's one disease. I get it. I have one syndrome like the next person. It's a syndrome. It's heterogeneous disorder or label. And you've seen this before, a Venn diagram. And that's really what it is. And a lot of people have problems with that. You've seen the diagram of what you see above the water. But what you don't see is what's below the water. And it has a complex shape to it. So even if you look at it as one specific disease, that family of disorders masquerading as one unique disease, even so, there's varied burden of impact. So some people have much more disease with the same point on a rating scale. So not all diseases are equal, even when you classify them as being equal. So classic names, in reality, reflect descriptions of symptomatic disorders. Ultimately, the specific disease will be determined by an underlying mechanism or pathogenesis. So the names really change to reflect the guilty. I was taught hereditary neuropathy, a disease uh, described by Charcot, who first described multiple sclerosis and many other disorders. His students were Marie Tooth, Tourette, uh, Freud, Alzheimer's. So he had many students who learned a great deal from him. So the diseases were defined by traditional measures, four types. Get it? There's this type, that type, the other type, and the last type. Oh, type five is actually the, we don't know what that is. So it turns out now that it's defined by underlying genetics, there's at least more than 25, and to date, probably 50 different genetic markers. So the four type classification I learned in school is woefully inadequate. So the problem though is everybody needs a hero, Captain Obvious, um, and sometimes the doctors don't understand this, and the last thing you want is the heart surgeon going, oh, look, look what happens when you poke here. See what happens, the leg goes out. So sometimes what you learned is the obvious, and that doesn't help at all. So knowledge will set you free. Unfortunately, much of what you or the physician learn or may have already learned or hold dear might be obsolete in the future or even reflect a falsehood. For example, gastric ulcers, we learned that they were due to the overproduction of acid, and somebody who would stand up and say they're due to bacteria would have been laughed off the stage until it is true, and he did win a Nobel Prize for describing that. Uh, so impressions might reflect truth, might not reflect truth, and sometimes represent a preconception. So knowledge is never static, but it's always dynamic and evolving. 
And so what you really have to do is make the most of learning opportunities every day and share the information. So it's easy for rheumatoid arthritis. Look, it's a simple complaint. The exam is clearly abnormal, there's no question. And the test is abnormal. Oh look, the x-rays are abnormal. But some people have blood test positive. Oh, you have rheumatoid disease. Some people are blood test negative. I guess you don't have rheumatoid. Well, it's hard to tell someone whose hands look like this and their x-rays look like that, that they don't have rheumatoid, but the blood test. And the thing that makes it even more complicated, rheumatoid, you'd like to think this is a unifying disease or one disease, but the fact is rheumatoid arthritis can have non-joint manifestations. You can have rheumatoid nodules in liver, lung, bone, brain, many places, nerve, muscle. So it becomes a very confusing and complicated disorder. Orthopedists have it easier. Symptom onset, gee, when did that happen? Oh my goodness, I hurt my leg. It's obvious. You know when it happened, you know why it happened. But what you may not see is tendon or ligament damage or vascular or nerve damage. So for some diseases, it's really easy to make a diagnosis. Life should be so simple with answers and decisions, yes, no, black, white, up, down. Hematologists and oncologists have very easy uh, clinical trial outcomes, time through survival. Death is a very defined measure. Uh, for what we do, uh, sometimes it's not such a defined measure, and it's, and it's difficult. So ultimately, the times are changing, and you can have the world in your hand many different ways, and so you have to uh, change. And that's really the first part of this talk in terms of why it's difficult for you to get a diagnosis and for the doctor to see it. And that becomes a really difficult journey for all of us. So the next part was, why do I not have multiple sclerosis? And more importantly, not what multiple sclerosis is, the most important lesson is what can we learn from multiple sclerosis? And this, I think, is an extremely important part. So multiple sclerosis is a disease that really affects the central nervous system by definition, and it occurs when the insulation on the wires is stripped or damaged. So when you damage the insulation on the wires, for all of you who've had electric outlets that short out or light bulbs flicker or your phone drops a call and it irritates you, that is a problem with the connections. And multiple sclerosis is a connection disease, plain and simple. So prevalence, well, that's a funny question. 350,000 people in the United States, probably 500,000, more than a million worldwide, with an obvious diagnosis. Remember, an obvious or recognized diagnosis. How many more people have subtle or not recognized or late diagnosed? That's a great question. You know, recognized mean age of onset? Well, that's another funny question. We used to say MS doesn't happen in children. Wrong. It certainly does. MS doesn't happen in older population. Wrong. It certainly does. So recognized mean age of, age of onset, prevalence in women, more than men. And most people at diagnosis, because this is a circular argument, this is the way we diagnose it, and these are the symptoms you have. So everything fits into a neat box, have some relapsing episodes or attacks. So the two biggest lies in multiple sclerosis are relapsing, remitting. Relapsing means you've had an event, an attack. But it's really interesting because if you're not aware you've had the attack, and it's the comment of, gee, I thought it was heartburn, and I didn't realize I was having a heart attack. Or my sister, who's who's a pretty, pretty smart lady. She's the district attorney in Ulster County in New York State. And with her first child, she was two weeks post dates and they had Chinese food. And all night long, she had GI upset and kept on saying, I'm never going back to that restaurant. And by the morning when she realized, oh my goodness, I'm three minutes apart contractures, that's a problem. So the diagnosis is obvious at that point. Otherwise, before you've just related it to the Chinese food. So relapsing episodes, so lies in multiple sclerosis relapses. Not all relapses are obvious, and if you have an attack that I don't agree with you that's really an attack, then it doesn't happen. Or if you're not aware of it, it doesn't happen. And the other lie is remitting. Remitting means it goes away, it completely resolves. And I'll ask you the question, if something really remitted, it went away, why would we treat it? There would be no point of treating if it was truly a remitting or resolving disease because people accumulate damage. So the loss of insulation results in poor electrical conduction, 
poor coordination of signals. Because the way the brain works, it has to be real time, realistic, reproducible. You need accurate interpretation of information. And when that interpretation of information goes awry, then you have all sorts of weird things that happen. And sometimes it's called conduction block. You'd call that your phone call gets disconnected. Oops, got a call back. So this inflammation or damage, demyelination to the nerves, that's what MS does. And the answer is, that's also a lie, because sometimes at onset, wires can be cut, and sometimes it attacks nerve cells, so it becomes much more complicated than we actually believed before. So an MS an attack or an event is when you have this sudden disconnection. You'd call it hum in the line. Gee, I can't hear you, there's too much hum in the line. Or you'd say, gee, I gotta call you back, I can't hear you, or poof, magically, the phone call drops. And I have to say that always amazes me because from my perspective, I can drive on the Long Island Expressway, I'm 20 miles outside of New York City, one of the major cities in the world, and I have one bar on my phone. Like, what's up with that? When I was um, in Kenya and uh, Tanzania, I had five bars on my phone. I mean, I'm 20 miles from New York City, I have one bar, I am in the middle of nowhere, I have five bars, like, I, I, don't, I don't get it. So we make these definitions, you know, an MS attack, it's not because of a fever or a chemical or a blood chemistry change, and we make these definitions, but these are operational definitions to allow us to talk to each other. So the brain, look at it as a computer, a lot of wires, and a lot of connections and a lot of areas. So you have these areas of the brain that may do something, but it's not as organized as we'd like, and there's a lot of connections, there's a lot of networks. So you see these strings or wires joining different areas of the brain, and it becomes complicated, because on an MRI, you just don't see these things. So phrenology is when someone is feeling the bumps on your head, you can't feel what's inside. Like a tapestry, or a yarn, sometimes these connections can unravel. Like a piece of music, if the musician playing the flute stops playing, the music may be better or worse. So if you listen to music by Ives, what you might hear is something very different than a symphony. And one of the things I used to do to my oldest daughter, and I probably tortured her, so now she's a professor at UCAL Berkeley and uh, teaches opera music history, and one of the things she talks about is silence between the notes, screams and silence in opera. So one of the things I used to do when she was a kid, I would play music. Now imagine Herbie Mann is a jazz flute player playing the Beatles in reggae. It clearly is the Beatles. It clearly is a flute, and it clearly is a very different rhythm. So the fact is there are many different ways to listen to music. So MS interrupts these wiring diagrams. So the brain has evolved with many different wiring diagrams. So let's look at it as city lights. United States, we've all seen this map, but when you look at the United States at nighttime, you don't see these neat borders. So when we define things as nerve, muscle, different wiring connections, you just see a big landmass with a bunch of different lights. So you can't really tell where the state borders are, and that's what happens with many different diseases. There are no borders. So New York City, you know, wonderful lights at nighttime. And then what happens when you have a brownout or a disconnection? Lights go out, there are rolling grids, the city is dark, and geez, what happened to New York? It just dropped off the map. So like multiple sclerosis, when you lose wires, you may lose connection or functionality. And it's no different than rolling brownouts or power failures. So there are many different areas of the brain that do different functions, so if you disconnect wires, cognitive function, or if you damage the wire from your eye to the brain, you have vision loss, or if you damage the way the wires connect, the, uh, the way the eyes move, that's double vision. If you disconnect wires, you can have loss of sensations or bizarre sensations. You can have loss of strength, you can have incoordination, many different things that multiple sclerosis does. So for people with autonomic disorders, you've all seen these symptoms. Weakness, numbness, fatigue, vision problems, slurred speech, memory problems, depression, bowel bladder function. So this is the repertoire of the nervous system. So any disease that impacts the wiring of the nervous system will give you the same symptoms. <coughs> so these are recognized or accepted MS symptoms. 
visual problems, loss of vision, optic neuritis, blindness, double vision. Well, the interesting thing is, so whether it's weakness or abnormal sensations or incoordination, and cerebral means cognitive function. Now, it's interesting, presenting 4% and only 39%. Well, if you don't measure how people think, then you won't find that their thinking is impaired. And in fact, when you start to measure this, you'll probably find that 60, 75% of people with multiple sclerosis with plaque or abnormalities in the head have problems thinking. They may, they may not be aware of it, they may not be able to express it, and you may not believe it, but the fact is when you test people, you find these abnormalities. Examination is different. You may find clear weakness. You may find increased motor tone or clear incoordination. Sensory abnormalities, you may find loss of sensation, vibration, position sense, and there are positive and negative symptoms, and it doesn't mean good or bad. Negative symptoms are loss of function. You give someone vibration to test on their feet and they say, I can't feel it. Or positive is you take away the vibration and they say to you, I still feel it. And you're thinking, no, they don't feel it. There's no vib they're, they're clearly nuts. But it's prolonged sensations. And the prolonged sensations are extremely common. So most people don't appreciate that. Phantom limb, you get your leg chopped off and your brain still feels your toes. It's hard to explain to the doctor, my toes hurt, when he's looking at you saying, you have no toes. You can't possibly be telling me your toes hurt. I mean, that's clearly nuts. And it's most common for referred pain or these abnormal distributions of pain. Every time someone complains about having a heart attack and the pain is going down the left arm, that's actually a brain interpretation of where the pain is coming from. So if you have someone with no left arm, they will still have pain traveling down the left arm. So it's hard to say to a cardiologist, I have pain down my left arm. He's gonna say, uh, you don't have a left arm. You can't possibly have pain down your left arm. So it's the way the brain works. So what you see is not always what you get with these diseases. So MS, like autonomic problems, can be difficult to diagnose. Symptoms can come and go. Symptoms are gone before you get to the doctor. I mean, most people are not fainting in the doctor's office. Most people are not suddenly losing vision in the doctor's office. And especially when you say to someone, I feel it, but you can't see it. Well, that, that's a quick way for disconnection in a conversation. And the problem is, there are similar warning signs in many other diseases. So it's the differential diagnosis of do you know me? So people who have warnings of strokes or seizures, or people with Sjogren's or lupus or hole in the heart, or anxiety, B12, Bichette's, other abnormalities of autoimmunity and sometimes genetic abnormalities. There's a disease called hereditary spastic paraparesis or these genetic disorders called leukodystrophies. And you know what? They look just like multiple sclerosis. And in fact, they're commonly misdiagnosed as multiple sclerosis. And it may take people with HSP up to 10 years before they're recognized as having HSP. This is even with an obvious abnormality on a neurologic exam seeing a neurologist and they still can't recognize it. Because going back to the first couple of sides, remember, people don't come in with labels on their head. You might think I have multiple sclerosis because my legs are weak and stiff, but I actually have a genetic disorder. Wouldn't it be nice if people came in with such labels? So relapsing remitting is the most common recognized or diagnosed. Attacks come and go, symptoms resolve. Symptoms may be mild. So if you have mild numbness, you're saying to someone, well, you know, my leg went numb for a day last week. Well, you get to the doctor, your leg is not numb, it was last week. The first question is, what was the stress at home? That, that may not be the truth. So when episodes resolve spontaneously or appear to resolve, it's hard for someone to make a diagnosis. <clears throat> so we do things like take a history. We do things like an examination. But sometimes the examination demonstrates subtle things. So based on the experience and the time, it's easily missed. Fortunately, MRI scans have changed a lot where you can see abnormalities. Spinal taps, you can see abnormalities. But again, circular reasoning, we use the spinal tap as part of the diagnosis, but some people clearly have 
a clinical syndrome of multiple sclerosis and their spinal tap is negative because if I told you the nasty secret, which is the immune technology that we measure the abnormalities in the spinal fluid is 1970 technology, uh, that wouldn't thrill you. So, so there's, there's actually something that was just published called MS Precise, uh, which is a new immune metric, and I'm one of the people that was involved in that study. But the, but the point is, times change, information changes. So we use these tests, evoke potentials that look for electric short circuits, but even evoke potentials, they just tell you there's another abnormality you may not be aware of, but in reality, the disease that I said before, hereditary spastic paraparesis, they have the same electrical abnormalities by these tests that multiple sclerosis have. So it's not always so easy. So the older MRIs, the plaques are obvious. These white spots, not this, but these white spots here. So with better MRI technology, the spots become much easier to recognize. So it's easy to make a quick diagnosis. But I have to tell you, these things can also be seen in leukodystrophies and other diseases. So it's not pathognomonic at all. So as the MRI, these things are called Dawson's fingers, and the MRI shows abnormalities that are a pretty quick diagnosis. You see things in a spinal cord when someone wouldn't tell you spinal fluid immune abnormalities may be seen in a large percent of patients. However, if someone tells you, I can't see well, this is what vision would normally look like, but I can't put my eyes behind their eyes to see what they see or how they see. With an evoked potential, I can see there's an electrical short circuit and the delay and the waveforms are totally distorted. So these tests can give us additional information to validate what someone's saying to you. So the MRIs show you plaques, or they may show you something called black holes, which are signs of permanent damage, wires being cut. And when the burden is a lot, it's easy to make a diagnosis. However, there's visible and invisible multiple sclerosis. Relapses reported, physical disability become obvious. The natural history is you have attacks, and sometimes you get worse over time without attacks. But the MRI may show abnormalities in between attacks that don't always line up with what you see. So now already there's a disconnection. The MRI burden of disease, the amount of plaques you start to see over time accumulate, and the more damage you accumulate, the more it leaves you with permanency so even though the MRI doesn't show a big change in the amount of damage that it accumulates, when you look at brain volume, the brain volume decreases. So the more damage you accumulate, you may not even see it on MRIs at all times. So it becomes very difficult. So visible, invisible, multiple sclerosis, there are multiple levels of impairment, brain atrophy, shrink shrinkage, lesions that you may not see, or abnormalities on exam you may not see. So going from day one to two years later to five years later, there's a clear change in how much brain atrophy you have, but looking from scan to scan, you may not see it. When the changes are obvious, they're obvious. A diagnosis can be easy. <coughs> when the MRI shows something that lights up, it's an easy diagnosis. So when is it not so easy? Well, this is easy. This is seven Tesla MRI, which most of us don't have, and you start to see plaques right here, and you start to see a plaque right there, and it's easy to overlook these little white spots or call them Lyme, lupus, migraine, age-related changes, they're nothing. And remember, based on how thick the MRI is cut, like slicing a bologna, easy to miss these things. So even though the MRI is a great tool, it's led us a little astray because things we don't see, we don't know. And if you don't know them and you don't see them, they're not there, and therefore it's in your head. So the comment of it's in your head, well, cut someone's head off and they have no more problems. Pretty easy diagnosis. So MS is a little bit different because they accumulate <coughs> a, physical dis a physical disability. So Kurtzke did this EDSS. Um, and he made the scale, and it's a first pass, which we still use 50 years later. So the scale is fully ambulatory, have some problems, can't walk very far, needs a cane, 
needs a walker, can't walk, and the reason why this scale was invented is Kurtzky worked for the government. It was a military scale, so it was for veterans. You can either march, you can't march, you need help marching, and so here's this disability scale, and the amazing thing, and this is some of the work that I'm involved in, is you can have profound cognitive impairment, you can be completely disabled based on you can't work or you can't drive based on the cognitive burden of disease and have no physical disability and have a normal neurologic exam and on this scale be a zero or maybe a one. So it's not a great scale. And in fact, five is you have difficulty walking, six is you need a cane. So based on these kind of scales, 10 must be twice as bad as five, uh, but 10 is death. So I'm not quite sure that walking with difficulty is not quite as bad as half of death. So here's the reason, the lessons that you can learn. Relapsing multiple sclerosis leads to increasing disability and progression. So within about 10 years, uh, people have profound physical disability left untreated. People will get worse 30 to 50 percent left untreated by increasing changes on this EDSS within several years. 40% of people may need a walking device within five or 10 years. So this disease, left to its own devices, causes increasing disability. And once the inflammation accumulates, there's wires cut and damage is permanent. So one of the conversations yesterday as to why treat these diseases early is left untreated, many of them can cause increasing disability burden, and that's a key point. So. For multiple sclerosis, we use this scale, this EDSS, but in the shaker, there are many different domains, cognition, psychiatric, visual perception, fatigue, stiffness, balance, sleep disorders, strength, bowel, bladder, and these different bubbles can change independently, and not all of these bubbles affect this score. So it's a complicated score, and it's totally imperfect, but it is what we use at the current time. So the progression, of multiple sclerosis, you have a symptomatic event, and it may take a couple of events before we figure it out, but by that point, you've had a bunch of abnormalities on an MRI. And as the MRI causes increasing problems, the physical disability, the cognitive function adds up, and you start to have increasing problems. So relapsing, remitting becomes obvious in some cases. Some people don't recover. And this is the point about treatment. That's the natural history of the disease. When you treat later, you still have disability, maybe less. You treat earlier, there's less and less disability. So for diseases that are chronic, autoimmune, rheumatoid arthritis, it's great. You got to treat them early. But the problem is not all symptoms are obvious. And sometimes when you ask someone, where should I leave this? And it's obvious, so not all symptoms are obvious, especially when you're in the face of many other symptoms. So recognizing dysautonomia and multiple sclerosis in someone who's blind in one eye and paralyzed in both legs, that may not be the most paramount symptom. So when the obvious becomes the distraction, it's hard to do that. So what can we learn? There are probably more people with POTS, chronic fatigue, and unrecognized dysautonomia than multiple sclerosis. That may or may not be true but it might be. No antibodies have been defined for the vast majority of people with multiple sclerosis. We just heard someone say, well, how can you treat if there are no defined antibodies? Multiple sclerosis, there are no defined antibodies. And by the way, when we define antibodies in multiple sclerosis, we now call them a separate disease, neuromyelitis optica. Here's an antibody. So it's no longer lumped in with multiple sclerosis. So what we do know is there are more funding dollars in multiple sclerosis. Over the past 20 years, we've gone from no treatments to six injectable disease-modifying therapies, three oral medicines, three IV, much more to come. And there are several companies that have products in development that cause remyelination. Read that as recovery of function. Read that as another march towards a cure. So autonomic dysregulation in the last couple of minutes. Do people with multiple sclerosis have autonomic problems? Sure, sweating problems, urinary problems, orthostatic dysregulation, gastrointestinal symptoms, sexual dysfunction, fatigue, sleep disorders. <clears throat> Gee, it just sounds like all the other autonomic disorders you heard. Remember, treatment is primarily symptomatic, 
but more importantly, disease modifying in multiple sclerosis. So very few people pay attention to blood pressure or cardiac issues in multiple sclerosis. Too many balls to juggle. So the MRI defines the changes, but it also changes the focus of the disease. Lost in the distraction of the symphony of symptoms are the problems related to the autonomic problems. The standard assessment doesn't even include autonomic testing. And in fact, there is no standardization for autonomic testing in multiple sclerosis. So neurogenic bladder, common in people with multiple sclerosis, more than 90%, whether it's dribble, urinary urgency, incomplete emptying. So there are many people that have very complicated disorders, storage problems, voiding problems, combination. <clears throat> and it may very well be that 40 to 80% of people with multiple sclerosis also have GI symptoms. Gee, that sounds familiar. Constipation, fecal incontinence, bloating, combination. So it's a complicated area, but oftentimes it's given the short shrift as to what this is and why you should address it. For some of you, it may sound similar. Gee, it's a symptomatic repertoire. And the etiology of the symptoms are really complicated. And if I told you that the pathways for neural control of even going to the bathroom are not fully defined, that is really a sad comment, but that is where we stand. Uh, and if I told you there's limited data on the background of upper GI symptoms in people with MS, and for people who know me, my comment is, seriously? Really? That should be so obvious to identify. Cardiovascular problems, yes. People with multiple sclerosis can have variability in regulation of blood pressure. And depending upon how you define it, it may be more or less common. So it depends upon who you study, how you study it, how you define it. So cognitive function, brain fog, yes. Awareness of deficit is not optimal. Most people don't recognize they have a problem. Sleep disorders are extremely common in multiple sclerosis. 70% of people may have unrecognized obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, so it becomes really complicated. And even the scales you use for fatigue, if I told you one study looking at 200 people with multiple sclerosis, looking at fatigue severity and modified fatigue impact scale, these are two well-recognized accepted scales. 20% of them had discordant outcomes, high in one, low in the other, or vice versa. So a big 20%. So the question is what you choose to measure, how you measure, how many things can you measure, it's a juggling game. So multiple sclerosis does have dysautonomia associated with it, but there are so many things to recognize, it becomes really difficult. And so the scales <coughs> and the diagnostic classifications, it's like ill-fitting clothes. That's the way we classify our patients. That's the way we evaluate treatment responses. It doesn't always work so well. So ultimately, can we do better? We can do better. Um, and the comment, it's not because things are difficult, that we don't dare, it's because we don't dare that they are difficult, and, and that's really important. So the bottom, the bottom line for this, there is so much more to learn, whether it's multiple sclerosis or dysautonomia. If you listen to music, it's the silence between the notes that also make the music, and that's just as important as the music. Always be patient, understanding, and considerate, because we're not as knowledgeable as we'd like to be. The other comment you could make is walk a mile in your shoes walk a mile in my shoes, walk a mile and appreciate what someone else's problem is. The comment about it's always difficult to make predictions, especially when it's about the future, I doubt Yogi Berra ever read a physicist like Niels Bohr's writings. Uh, so let me stop there and say thank you for your attention. It's a complicated topic. And if there's any questions, I probably won't be able to answer them, but I can make a stab at it. So everybody's an expert. Expert in the confusion of what multiple sclerosis is. So the question you're asking about is, are these diseases genetic? And the answer is yes and no. So if you and it's, and it's an easy answer. It's like lotto balls. You inherit a bunch of immune response genes. Why the gene for Alzheimer's disease turns on at age 50 and not 80, that's a great question. Some genes turn on. So there are some genetic disorders 
a Tay-Sachs disease where they turn on and you're dead at age three. And there's certainly four or five people I take care of in their 50s who have adult manifestations of adult onset Tay-Sachs disease. So when it's supposed to start, when it starts. So for immune diseases, whether the genetic combination starts at the onset or whether it's something, medication, virus, or something else external that now interacts, sets off a cross response, and how it's diagnosed, that becomes the whole syndrome of familial um, immunologic disorders. So the question you ask is, if my mother has MS, will I likely have MS? And it's not so simple, probably about 10% of people, but what you see more is a cousin has Hashimoto's thyroiditis, someone else has Crohn's disease, another family has member has um, ulcerative colitis or eczema. And the fact is, most people who get diagnosed as thyroid disease never get told that they actually have autoimmune thyroiditis. It's just you got too much or too little. So if you ask your cousins, do you have thyroid disease or do you have eczema, you're not, you can't even get those answers. I mean, he, here's the example to that. In my family, there's a BRCA gene which causes breast, ovarian, and pancreatic cancer. My sister died from pancreatic cancer, and I have a cousin with um, breast and another cousin with breast and ovarian. So my mother's two brothers, one daughter among many different children, and a grandmother had ovarian cancer, and her brother died from pancreatic cancer. So it's a well-described family of BRCA gene. And when I explain to my cousins that this is genetic, they go, you're kidding. They're so wrong. It's not genetic. They all have different cancers. I don't know what you're talking about. So the question you ask is, is it genetic? Yeah. Does that mean you'll get it? Tough answer. Thank you. Thank you.